Hi, everyone. I'm just going to do the welcome again for some of you were in the business meeting, but there's a few new faces in the room for this part of the event. Um, so just to um, introduce myself, I'm Nick McGrath. I'm the convener of the ASA Big Branch. And Susan Tyndall is Susanna. I'm calling you Susan. What the hell? <laughs> Sorry, it's just because I'm getting recorded. I'm going to screw up everything I'm saying. Susanna Tyndall, our wonderful secretary, a wonderful treasurer. I couldn't do this without you. Thank you very much for, for all that you do for the branch. And Jack, he's in the room, is one of our committee members. Sophie's in the room. And Violet is also a committee member, but is an apology. And am I all, oh, what am I forgetting? Is that it? And unofficially Elliot. And unofficially Elliot, that also helps us amazingly. Um, so just going to start with an acknowledgement. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands we are meeting on, the Wurundjeri people, and recognize their continuing connection to land, water, culture, and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present. We honor local community traditions of caring for archives and culture through country, through songs and stories. Okay, today's topic, <laughs> um, I think may have even, you know, I've even confused myself trying to explain it to others. And I know for the, for the panel, I know this is a very big topic. So I just want to make you feel relaxed. <laughs> Don't worry about what I'm saying. <laughs> we're recorded today. What we're talking about, I'm just, we're just saying our own, views on things, um, drawing on our own, you know, knowledge, uh, expertise, but you don't need to solve the world's problems today. Okay. Does that make everyone feel a bit mm, more? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. I hope that makes you feel better. Um, so the topic, Violet came up with this amazing topic and I know it's a shame that Violet's mm. right here, but I'm glad we're recording, but this is for you, Violet, and everyone else that's listening. <laughs> um, uh, what we want to talk about today is a very interesting topic and it makes me very anxious. So anyway, lots of things make me anxious in the world today, but um, what we're going to talk about, I'm going to start with a question and anyone that wants to jump in the panel and anyone that wants to ask questions, like just do so online, let us know. You can just like unmute yourself because we might not see the chat um, and just say your questions. But um, so the, the topic that we're starting with, the question I want to ask you is a big one. Um, what do we do when a disaster hits our community? This is big. So fire, flood, or the death of a knowledge holder, and how do we rebuild? And I'm going to really broaden the, the definition of what an archive is. I'm For today's discussion, and this is something that I personally think, this is my own views, I guess. I don't know if anyone agrees with me. Archives are physical things but they're people and places too. So when I think of archives, that's that's how I'm defining it today. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, I define that, that every day, but not everyone may agree with me. So how, so that's the first question. <laughs> um, and how can we be better prepared to protect our archives? So that be that records, however you define records, people and places against disasters. So this is a big topic. Okay, so on our panel, so I'm not expecting you guys to know everything about this topic. So we've got Lizzie McCartney, who's the Manager of Conservation at Museums Victoria. John Patton, who's the Manager of Diversity and Belonging at Museums Victoria as well. So I basically just got my work away. <laughs> <laughs> like, they can't escape me. <laughs> um, that was an evil laugh. Um, Kim, Kim Burrell, who's also lovely. Thank you for being here. <laughs> <laughs> University Archivist at Victoria University and the ASA Ref on the Blue Shield Australia Committee. And Michaela Hart, um, who's our Digital Archivist at Department of Health and Human Services and a member of um, Archivists Against History Repeating Itself Collective, which I feel like I need to join, but I feel like I can't. Yeah, I need to update my bio. Okay, <laughs> we'll do that. We'll do that as well. So that's a lot. Um, there's a lot of amazing people in the room as well. So thank you for for joining us. Um, okay, does anyone feel brave enough to start the conversation? John, I'm just gonna. This is so <laughs> weird. <laughs> you look so sweet there. Okay, John, do you have anything to say to start off? Yeah, absolutely. I mean. Uh, you and I have previously had a conversation about this, that archives are absolutely a, a lot more than what you find in physical archives. I mean, if I walk through country and I see a scar tree, you know, there is a, an archive that sometimes will have a, a scar on it that tells a particular story and holds knowledge to pass on to another generation. And so 
it's those spaces that might be marked with, with language and um, symbology, but also that the country itself and how we read it and how it changes with disasters. And so that can easily be lost. The different elements of the, the country itself that can teach us about what's happened in the past. And so for me, it's absolutely critical that we not only acknowledge that, but recognize the value in maintaining links to those different types of archives, as well as when it comes to people as well. So oral, oral tradition being incredi incredibly important for Koori people like myself that, uh, you know, very often uh, I'll utilize it uh, alongside a, a, a standard archive and do research and find that the archival material, it can often be tainted by the, the personality and the um, politics behind the people who've placed that material there. Whereas the, you can also find that in an individual or a community, but sometimes it's not as common. And so having a, a broader understanding and appreciation of, of all the different types of material that we can use to, to learn about ourselves and the past and how we can use that for the future is critical. Wow. Thanks, John. John, I remember you giving us a presentation once about um, the, a, a walk around your home and around your neighbourhood and all of the archive of the plants and trees. And um, it just, I think about it a lot. Um, thank you. Um, I thought I might chime in with a bit of knowledge management stuff with a story from the pandemic. If that's yeah. all right. Um, and the um, most of what I've got my laptop, everybody, I've got my laptop open because I gave a talk on climate um, resilience and hope at the last ASA conference, and I've got a whole bunch of factoids on here that if I get a chance, I'll throw at you. But um, I, I spoke then about the cognitive dissonance that's at play in our profession because I'm, you know, I think, and I think this is why Violet invited me, which is um, that I don't think that um, we can separate climate, the climate emergency from um, our archival profession because <clears throat> um, why are we working to keep things around for 500 years if we're not simultaneously working to keep the planet, like if the planet's not compatible with human life in 500 years, like are we keeping it alive for the birds? I mean, they've proven themselves resilient. We have not. Um, but in terms of, so you'll remember the massive bushfires that we had the summer before the pandemic hit. So as Nicola said, I'm the um, senior archivist for the Department of Health and um, so we were one of the major agencies responding to the bushfire emergency and all of the record keeping that had that came as a result of that. And we'd only just, like it was only just over when the pandemic hit and everybody left the offices. So all of the record keeping for that just helped in corners, in rooms and Sophie's nodding because it would have happened. At the, yeah. And um, and then the pandemic hit and we didn't have technology in place at that time to support what we needed. And the lesson for me was that I trust, my, my team and I had to trust our archival instincts. And there were lots of people with lots of technology wanting to make apps that very quickly solved problems that actually weren't grounded in archival understanding. And um, and they were shown to be flawed at the end of the day when we went looking for the records, the paper that we'd kept and the systems that we'd put in place were the ones that had what we needed and that were discoverable. So I think we need to um, trust ourselves. Um, yeah. I'm not quite sure where I was going with that story, but we'll, we'll see if I've got more to say on it later. So, as, as a conservator, like you've had to manage like, you know, flooding, flash flooding disasters that have happened at the museum. And yeah. like water ones are our most water, common. Yeah. yeah. And I guess 
when so, like I'm just going to go to a practical space maybe like if something like that happens I guess if you have the disaster bins like ready as an archivist if you come across or if anyone that comes across that kind of disaster and you're like oh what in your experience like what is the best way to prevent the worst case kind of scenario when you come across like a you know a flooding situation in a workplace but people might encounter this like for the archivists that are like we have members all across Victoria they might work in like university archives school archives like there might be historical societies lots of different like locations yeah what's your kind of first bit of advice that you give people I think um Probably one of the best things you can do happens, I mean, I can get onto what happens once it's actually happened, but probably one of the best things you can do happens before the disaster mm. and it's in the preparation. Mm. And there are a lot of resources for that um, kind of references in um, Blue Shield and the AICCM website around disaster preparedness, but there are kind of four main steps to disaster preparedness and response and the first one is prevention and then you get to preparation and it's those two initial steps that I think are really going to help you and change the way you can then react in the moment and then also how you then recover from it afterwards and um it will obviously depend on the organisation you're working with the nature of your collection what resources you have available to you but there are some really even they kind of seem straightforward steps to prepare essentially a disaster preparedness plan that involve kind of taking a moment sitting down with a range of stakeholders and looking at what you have and where the risks might be and then kind of creating a plan from that um and there are lots of advantages to that just in terms of what you then learn about your own organization how you can prioritize what steps you might need to take but um, you also kind of build knowledge in the organisation as well, which is really useful because disaster preparedness and response is kind of a group exercise. It's not, it's one of those situations where, I mean, we all work in this space anyway, we realise the benefit of cross um, uh, working with different disciplines. Um, it gives yeah, you the opportunity to like support. No, no, yeah, it's not so good. Um, we might have someone on can you just turn their mute on please it gives you the opportunity to then work out what um kind of other organizations to make connections with whether it's like your local fire department or other emergency services so that they can learn more about your organization and your collection as well um i'll also i'll send you after this there was a, the aiccm did a well the vic no no it wasn't a, it was the Preventive SIG, I think, special interest group, did a really interesting lecture series last year on agents of deterioration. And they did one on disasters, mm -hmm. which they recorded, which is really interesting. And they presented two really interesting cases, well, a couple of different NCA studies. But one was from um, Bundanong, which is the Arthur Boyd. Yeah. So they responded to bushfires. And so yeah. she talks through that, which was really interesting. And then another woman who does a lot of work, she's based in New Zealand. She was talking about the Christchurch um, incidents. And she said after they'd been working with, um, doing a lot of work after the Christchurch earthquakes, they even got to the point of developing these relationships with other um, services where they then came to the heritage kind of organisation. New Zealand said, tell us where your heritage sites are in Christchurch mm. so we can overlay them onto our more general mm. emergency plans so that we know, you know, mm. what when we're looking at a whole of city disaster, as it was in that case, how we can incorporate that knowledge into what how we respond. Mm. And so I think there's lots and lots of benefits in that initial stage of kind of working out what you've got, working out what where your risks might be. And then it could be, you know, simple things like, oh, every year we need to clear out the gutters at this mm. point mm -hmm. and again the AICCM has a nice kind of disaster preparedness calendar with stickers and so you <laughs> kind of yeah. once you know you work out what you can put it like oh it's May I need to do this or you know whatever it is so you can kind of start to put in a yearly kind of preparation mm -hmm. but um yeah there's just some really lovely steps and then as you're building this plan as I said you then kind of 
build um, buy-in in the organization or among your groups, your volunteers, whoever it is who might be helping you with this, which I think is really important um, in terms of uh, getting people engaged and kind of invested in assisting. Um, then the, the interesting thing that leads on from that, of course, is that there's a difference in how you might respond to a localized um, disaster, such as something, you know, like a water leak in your, or something that's just specific to your organization and something that is a whole of community, because then, um, as I, I think you were kind of referring to as well, then it becomes a community thing. And so then there's a whole lot of care of people that needs to come into it as well, because mm -hmm. the people who you might be drawing on to help you with your disaster are going to be also concerned about their own family, their own mm -hmm. houses, their own properties. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the trauma that, you know, the community-wide trauma. Mm -hmm. There's also in that same, it's a really good presentation. <laughs> there's another, <laughs> another woman, and I'll just get the conversation from the Creative Recovery Network. Adrian, mm -hmm. Yeah, they do a lot of work yeah. um, with communities who have been through disasters, but ref um, recognising that archives and other kind of um, cultural organisations mm. are areas of knowledge holding and really important to people and kind of um, connecting that and connecting the community with that can be a really powerful way of kind of helping with recovery yeah. mm. as well. Mm. And she talks about... Um, how uh, unlocking the creative brain can help you move out of the flight or fight response. So there's just, there's so much kind of opportunity in the space that we work in to, I think, contribute to the whole kind of process to build community relationships kind of along the whole way. Also interesting. I'm sorry, so, then I know, I was just thinking then, of course, there's the collecting institutions who are capturing the yeah. memory of, yeah. yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. And even little practical, I mean, but in when you look at, and again, mm. details, but you know, you practice disaster plans and you train mm. people and things in that, even in that, the Red Cross has reported that in a kind of in an emergency, people are working at about 20% of their oh, yeah. kind of decision making ability. So having something that people are familiar with, mm -hmm. that they've gone through, they've trained, yeah, that they've trained in. Yeah. So you're just doing it almost by rote yeah. when it comes up. Is, I have to go and make this phone call. I have yeah, to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And that's really helpful. Yeah. Actually, it's really helpful. And then mm. also you're kind of taking away some of that stress from mm. your people mm. as well because yeah. they know it's been thought about. They know it's been planned. They've had discussions about what is their most significant item. Yeah. So they're not trying to make that decision in the yeah. middle of something that's really yeah. stressful. And you might have a, a split second to make a decision. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think also a good thing to remember at least in the recovery phase, is that, I mean, obviously with disasters, people are the most important yeah. thing. Like that's just, that's just, mm -hmm. emerging, that's yeah, number one. But then after that, there's always time. Like, mm -hmm. like once you've got the safety stuff out of the way, there's always time to think you'll have, you know, the plan that you've made, some recommendations or people you need to contact, but taking a moment and looking around, there's always time for that and that's super useful. So you don't have to kind of rush in and just, mm -hmm. Immediately. Someone could get hurt. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you can, because each, each disaster is also different. Like, yeah. you know, sometimes yeah. the most common one, and these are not disasters, but they're just collection incidents. But you know, <laughs> freezers. Our freezers used to go off all the time, like die at the museum, and then you've got DNA just <laughs> dying, um, which is is time sensitive. But, you know, you know, you still have to think about that. If I'm going to transfer that DNA into another freezer, how am I going to do that to make sure that it's the safest thing or that's mm -hmm. different to a water event? So, um, yeah, taking the time to stop and think and hopefully, you know, you'll have the structure in place that will help you do that as well. I think giving people that support in those situations through preparation is important. And I guess there's like you're saying there's resources. So if, a, if you're a smaller organization you don't have to write this from no scratch. absolutely you do no. not everyone has thought about this so much yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely yeah 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 and there's some really there's 
be prepared, which is was by it's not called CAN anymore, it's called something else now. Mm. But that's available on both ARC team and I think Blue Shield websites. And that has some really nice kind of prompts mm. and is very it's not super technical. Yeah. The Getty has a really good mm -hmm. one as well, but that is bigger and a little more kind of involved and stuff. But there's lots of resources because, yes, let's not reinvent the wheel. Yeah. It's not mm -hmm. necessary. And then you can take it to whatever level you need to for your particular collection, your particular setup. Yeah. yeah. It sounds really obvious, but I think it's One of the things that I learned about all these actually, there are these resources. But make sure you've looked at them. Don't wait until it's, there's an emergency. Yeah. yeah. But it sort of seems really yeah. like it's it's a really it's a really dumb thing to assume. But actually a lot of people work with in in our sector, you know, like you work might you might work for limited time yes. or you are the only person or all of those things yeah, yeah, um, yeah. you know and and you work under all sorts of you know resource poor as well and you know you wouldn't necessarily find the time in the day to uh, just I'll just look up that yeah that totally. resource and review that preparation plan. yeah because and that needs to be up that needs to be revisited really regularly and it's it's not seasonal anymore. Like we can't no, we no. can't think oh it's, it's winter, it's gonna rain and it, we can't do no, it. Yeah. It's gonna become more events, do you think, too in the future? So we need to all be ready. That's, that's a given, isn't it? Yeah. It's hard enough to think of the disaster without adding yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. And you know, making that sort of yeah. oh, but look, you know, if things can happen in urban settings in places that are look seem quite secure and safe and yeah. you forget that the river is yeah. you think that river down the hill is never yeah. going to flood yeah. but it does. Yeah. And it's so um, going to get it off lightning strike and off it goes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really true. Yeah, so mm. yeah. yeah. that's a very good point I think. I think it's easy to say, oh, that's that really big document that I don't want to read. Yeah. One day and then you never read it. It's so, over, right? Yeah. 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 Boring. Yeah. This is not, yeah. it's just not obviously sexy work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You kind of have to um, work out that there, there are positives in there. There are these kind of things mm. that will come out of it and find kind of the, the motivation from that. You are going to learn more about your collection. You're going to learn more about your organization you're going to make connections yeah. with other people you're going to maybe work out there's another one down not you know we probably make connections with people but deepen connections with other organizations yeah. nearby yeah. are we going to share that resource or you know yeah. if you've got if that happens to you maybe we can come help you or what have you written about that because we could use that yeah. information as well yeah well, can it, I... it is really important to have the connection that's just and um, I, I guess another another I, I say challenge, but I don't mean to be negative about it, but is to actually sort of sell that plan and that documentation and the need for this this preparedness and um, being the understanding of a response and recovery phase with the rest of your organisation. Mm. It, it can't mm. reside with mm. a small number of people. Mm. It has to be. It, it's so, I think in some ways, I feel like that, in some contexts, could be a, could be the most difficult part. Mm. Actually, it's because it it, it is a constant. Um, certainly, it's a constant of my role to continually explain to people what archives yeah. are <laughs> and why they're important. Yeah, and but, and you know, on a bad yeah. day, what do you do? Yeah, you know, and that that isn't. Are isn't, you an activist? No, I'm an archivist. Oh, <laughs> but, <laughs> But the more you push me. <laughs> that yeah. um, advocacy component speaks to one of the things that I realised was a risk. I'm interested mm. to know what uh, other people in the room and our panellists have got. I, I've been, I realised recently how much of a risk digital preservation is to mm. climate manage, disaster management, sorry, um, because I've recently redid our disaster management, refreshed it, message did some messaging summer's coming mm. um 
Oh, but we don't need to do that anymore because everything's online now, isn't it? Hmm. I, I have, and have to reinterrogate the fact that we have paper-based collections. We've got 52 divisional officers that are in risk, um, you know, vulnerable areas. Um, just, you know, that on my way to Canberra last year, I had to change my take my ticket from train to plane because of the floods that were were happening while my colleagues were sandbagging our offices and moving records to the, you know, this is our reality. It's not a future um, thing now and we need to rehearse it as well as be prepared for it. So I think I was wondering, like, not just read it, but actually rehearse it. Mm -hmm. um, should we be doing, um, like, evacuation drills or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, I, I've worked in admittedly quite large organisations where that did happen. And, and mm -hmm. we have five jobs in organisations. Yeah. yeah. So. But what do you do with the records? records? With your records? Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't <laughs> take <laughs> my <laughs> records. <laughs> you know, like we were talking about. The archivist. Our <laughs> high risk, high value records, which are the ones mm -hmm. that are supposed to be looking mm -hmm. to preserve first. And, mm -hmm. And um, the, the, yeah, I think that's a really, I mean, again, that seems obvious to us, but I don't think it is always obvious that we, we identify, you know, what are we saving first, basically, our, mm -hmm. our most important records, mm -hmm. and the, which is, you know, that's a, hard, that's a tough decision. Can I ask how receptive the five departments actually are and we're not a large organization but I'm just about to run our plan and one of the things is contact the, the, the fire station the closest yeah. one had people had experiences are they, they're quite receptive to identifying which area of the building needs to be saved first that type of thing or I haven't tried to ask for that sort of um, special treatment um yeah, I know they are. I know they know about the museum, but we are obviously. Large, my experience yeah, is from quite large organisations, so I haven't. I yeah. must admit, I don't personally have experience with a smaller organisation, mm. but other people might. Mm. Agree with that. I'll let you know next. Time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My committee's made it my priority in the next next uh, next yeah. month or so. Yeah. It's based on heritage building, so it's a resident of uni. So Ormond was due to burned down about two minutes and the building that lived in for two years, I think it was about a minute and a half because it was insulated with pine needles. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so it was like one day we accidentally set off Ormond's fire alarms and my whole college just left because we're like, we don't want to have to pay for this. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And, and they have to send more trucks because of course it's a huge building. I'm like, why are you just going to scatter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think um, the Royal Historical Society in Victoria is a good place to go for any kind of small collecting institution, mm -hmm. whether they're historical societies or not, because they've got experience in giving advice to those really small community mm -hmm. sort of organisations. Um, following on from the comment about training, um, which is super important and Prepping for this reminded me that we haven't done some for quite a while in <laughs> the museum. Is the kind of the recovery just drills or just even talking through it? But I think um, even if you're not kind of actively kind of doing it in person, like there's a thing, how do I move it? Although I do think that just even mock-ups of objects because for example water mm -hmm. water is involved with so many disasters fire and mm -hmm. flood because mm -hmm. things often end up wet wet mm -hmm. probably even doing something like wetting a whole lot of even just newspapers mm -hmm. that you have and just getting giving people who might not always who might be going to help you but might not always have experience handling those kind of things just a little bit of hands-on experience mm -hmm. because you do have to handle them differently they feel different Oh, could be something that's kind of simple and easy as a way so again people aren't coming to the disaster feeling like oh my gosh I have never done this before or I don't know what I'm doing mm -hmm. familiarizing themselves with a little bit of that or even just um with your kind of main group who you've identified as people who might be responding even just talking through scenarios making them really specific but even just talking through things so this oh let's pretend this has happened what yeah. would we do and going through the steps yeah. so that people can even kind of visualize it and put yeah. themselves 
oh, this is that bit of the plan. And then for this one, I would do that if you're not kind of running a whole scenario, which is not possible, obviously, yeah. in all situations. But it's a way of kind of also testing things to work out if you've missed gaps and mm. things like that. I was going to sort of bring it back to what you were saying, John, before about if there's a fire and there's a scar tree that maybe is lost in a fire. This is like, this is really putting you on the spot, but just let, yeah. What what happens like if they're, you know, with scar trees, for example, they're known you, for the country that you know, have you ever had personal experience of like a disaster happening and then what, do, you, do you go and sort of check have you ever done that, like gone onto country after when it's safe to do so and sort of check what's happened to that scar tree, for example? Do you have any stories for us? Yeah, quite a lot. Um, it's it's a common thing for community to check in on uh, materials and different sites um, and on, on people as well, just to see how things are. I mean, my country being Yorta Yorta and Bunjilung, both are heavily flood prone. And one story, I've been revisiting past trauma uh, whilst listening to, to everyone else, um, thinking about uh, an example is with the, the floods in Lismore. Um, a number of years ago, uh, I'd located some artefacts that were held by the uh, Richmond River Historical Society. And, you know, you would think generally they're, they're in safe hands, but um, we, we know that that river will flood again. And it does every 10 to 15 years. It's only that we've just had one of the, the larger ones. Um, but uh, there were two clubs, uh, uh, war clubs, uh, fighting sticks that were in the collection there. And one of them had my great, great grandfather's signature on it. And um, I don't, think they're still in, in the the archive now because they're possibly down the river they've not located them and even when I think to um, uh, not, not so much just general paper archives but museum practices um, we like to think we're we're on on top of things but even you know, international examples where uh, do I, I've traced artifacts that were held in a, a museum in the Netherlands, uh, looking up uh, animal skin cloaks, because they are one of our rarest artifacts that are um, quite often tied to Victoria, but were found throughout much of Australia. And I'd found a, a cloak listed on a, a Dutch website, um, which was from Bunjalung country in northern New South Wales. And I got quite excited about it, only to find that their record, whilst uh, that was up to date in, in that they'd actually did very little to, to record that object. Uh, they'd written a paragraph about the person who collected it, but nothing more uh, other than the, the site where it came from in the year. No photograph, no illustration, and they disposed of the cloak because it had deteriorated because their practices weren't up to scratch. So that was the only example of that from my country, and that's that's gone now. So it, it can be quite heartbreaking that one of the, the first things I think about with archival and museum practices is, is the idea that proper resourcing, I know it's not always possible, but the idea to ensure that we do have the right practices, the, the right um, archival conditions, the right number of staff to be able to carry out uh, material rescues when when something does hit us, whether it's a fire or a flood or a swarm of bees, whatever the case it may be, you know that um, often we we can plan ahead, but if the money isn't there to ensure that we have uh, the ability to be able to put things into to play. It's not always possible. Yeah, I guess that opens up another thing about, like, yeah, the government taking this more mm. seriously into the future. Like, yeah. I, well, John was, John, I was just again thinking about, you know, you talk about resourcing. So, 
part of, I, after I gave the talk in Canberra last year, I got invited to go and speak to the heads of NASLA corporate services. So not the curators of the um, collections managers, but the um, the bean counters who are in, responsible for actually looking after the buildings. And it made me, and being, so those all the heads of the state libraries in, in Australia and New Zealand in the room and me, talking to them about climate change and why they should care. And um, so one of the stories I told them in the UK, the National Trust have done a study and they've acknowledged that climate change is the biggest threat facing them and their collections. Um, because, uh, and in terms of what you were saying about government, so the, the NASLA corporate services directors care now because they're gonna be asked to attest to what they're doing to, to mitigate against climate um, climate related disasters now like this is this will be what they have to start doing now and um yeah so the, and, the, and that's a sort of um and it's a yeah I, mean, I think it's really interesting to think about who the people that, uh, that we need to talk to about disaster planning are it's not necessarily the um no. it also speaks to what you were saying before mm -hmm. about that importance of having um cross-platform yeah. conversations with people need to yeah yeah definitely we do it definitely yeah yeah it's a it's one of those strange two-way things in our archives some like we sort of have conversations like this quite often like we're actually proposing to you a bad thing. Um, like we're we're asking you for money, and what you, we pose to you is like, do you understand the risk mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of losing mm -hmm. these documents, or mm -hmm. losing these objects, mm -hmm. or damage, or having them irretrievably damaged? Mm -hmm. And so we're sort of, you know, um, I I always found myself a bit conflicted in those conversations because it's almost like I'm sort of using these these items and and documents is like a bargaining tool as like a pawn to sort of you know try and beat some sense into to people that to have them understand what like, you have to you have to look after this situation mm. you know? this is um it's it's of like business value as well in mm. many instances as well as that incredibly sort of intangible value that um, collections have to all sorts of different members of the communities. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to sort of see if anyone has any questions in the room or online. Does anyone want to, does anyone have a comment or question? Yeah, I'm just enjoying Sally. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess to sort of like pivot back to the idea of um, archives being about like people and places and sort of thinking about my experience at um, like prior in art galleries and the idea of stuff being created that's ephemeral or mm -hmm. like designed to not be kept. And I guess I was just as like a sort of slight pivot, um, but interested in terms of like disaster, disaster recovery, uh, the idea of like working in that into your plan the things that are you meant to let go or even the idea of reporting the gap that's left by something as mm. opposed to capturing the thing itself that's really interesting um i was just going to say something quickly like a few or maybe 10 years ago i went to the egyptian museum in cairo and when i came home like disaster like hit and protesters like um, got into the museum and burnt artifacts and things but I found out that someone in the museum that worked there grabbed the emu database or something like and then they ran out like with their lives kind of thing but because they had the the database that they knew like the catalogue of what was there they were able to piece together because it was such a just like complete chaos so at least they could like what you're talking about you know what was what is missing after a disaster so they were, they could sort of look at, you know besides seeing like things burnt like those wooden artifacts burnt and like just lying on the floor and so you could sort of see some kind of evidence but I think that would also help um 
knowing what is lost, I, I think maybe that is helpful. Um, yeah. It's sort of documenting it was there, like there was photographs of it in maybe it's, a database. I think it's vital. Yeah. I think it's vital to document. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I had an image of a stuffed emu. But that's, I, I think, I think it's vital. And, yeah. I, and I, one of the things I was thinking about was actually, you know, um, I don't know why I'm using my hands because the database is not physical. It is a, it is a digital object. Um, is that I could, it's really important to have that yeah. everything documented in and and it retained in some way. I don't know um, the safest way to retain things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the um, the presentation at the uh, this year's ASA conference about the United Aborigines Mission mm -hmm. archive and the loss of significant mm. amounts of that collection mm. and the fact that they're the the I guess members of the community are reconceptualizing what the archive is by just asking anyone who might have accessed it and taken photographs mm. of the records or might have scans or photocopies or things mm. that ne aren't necessarily the original record but that can replace what mm. was lost mm. and to actually mm. rebuild. Mm. Um, yeah, and that that that's a disaster. The yeah. loss of that yeah. collection, or the as far as we know, the loss of that collection. Oh, that's that's, that's, making me think. that's an interesting point because I'm just going to ask John John mm -hmm. this question too. So, is a photograph enough? Like, if you lose it all. Like if a statue is, oh no, I don't know where that sounds coming from. Um, somebody needs to mute themselves. <laughs> I think that's why that's worked. Sorry, um, um, someone's just crinkling something. It's really hard to hear. I think, have they stopped crinkling? I've yeah. Done the, they haven't yeah. them off. Um, <laughs> nobody comes in. Yeah. Um, it's nearly, nearly time to eat. But um, John, I was just going to ask, like, with... If something is lost, like in a disaster, and the only thing that you have left is maybe a record of that that whatever was lost, like if, and like and I'm thinking, say, like I'm just using the example of a scar tree. What, is that enough for you, like to know, like at least have some? It's not enough. Like, no, it doesn't kind of no, I can never re what, replace something like that. Uh, look, the the way I would think about it is the the way. Melbourne Museum approached uh, people losing their homes in, in the, the bushfires where we've got a memorial to it, which is the the chimney that came from one of those homes. You know, it's a, a poignant thing for people to reflect upon. But I was heartbroken to find that this cloak that I, I had been tracing no longer existed because, you know, someone didn't decide to put it in an airtight container or whatever um that this is a, a common thing you know we 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 think about the kinds of structures that we produce all the different types of archives and museums and libraries um but you go right back to the, the history throughout all of history and think about the, the great library of alexandria being lost or the brazil museum or the museum that was in sydney that time and time again, we we lose these places and we lose so much. Much of coastal New South Wales um, Aboriginal heritage from the, the first 50 to 60 years of invasion is lost because it was all held in Sydney and burnt to a crisp, um, along with a lot of, you know, colony history as well. But... Um, when, when you have that that gap, you can reflect upon it, you can have conversations and you can tell stories and produce artworks and do all sorts of th things to connect with that. But one of the, the best things we can do is to think about, let's not let this happen again. And even when it comes to reevaluating what is an archive, when you're looking at someone who is a living, breathing archive and filled with oral traditions and who can pass that on, 
you're not going to be able to record all of that um you know doing audio recordings it's a, a lifelong process and you need that person to be able to be the next link in the chain and we're losing far too much because we don't necessarily always have that person who puts their hand up to be the next link in the chain and even when we look to who is an, an elder in the aboriginal community and obviously i'm going to keep going back to the, an aboriginal perspective on this but for for us whether it's us or someone in the Arctic Circle and their Sami or someone in the Scottish Highlands and trying to maintain their language or their culture, the, the thing that we have to do is to, to ensure that we are constantly interacting with it and passing it on to the younger generations. And where we frame it around elders having the knowledge, more often than not, it's not the elders who hold that knowledge it's the younger people because they've gone into the archives they are doing research they are connecting with archives they are working in archives and often our elders they have big gaps in knowledge and we still ask them questions and frame it around tell us how this works or what this is even if they don't know. And so that's that's problematic as well. We have to be able to recognise that sometimes someone doesn't know and that there are gaps. And so how do we identify that so that we can better build our archives to be able to ensure that we have that knowledge for the future? Well, right. I know there's... Um, let's just talk about how you document, like, your stories and your like things that you've researched and gained like do you think the best way you do you do it i guess would be sharing that knowledge online and through you know articles and through your art and other ways and just talking and sharing those stories hmm. or is it also is it when you go on the on country with your boys and you're sharing it with the next generation what what do you think is the how is just for people listening like how can we share that knowledge and make sure it doesn't die out with our, our elders and knowledge holders anyway uh and in every way there's no singular way that is better than the others you know if someone is visual and they're an artist and they want to document stories that that's a fantastic way for them to go if they want to do audio recordings if they want to do a graphic novel for, for me personally you, you've you've touched on it that I, I try to get what I've collected and what I can share and create a, an archive that can be accessed in many different ways through a, a number of different outlets, whether it's my history-based website or YouTube or writing a novel or a graphic novel or whatever and, and everything, because they all <laughs> interact with one another and they build out and flesh out the story because, you know, no matter which way you tell a story, there are always so many different perspectives. And so even if you as a one person, you, you have an opportunity to, to flesh out that singular perspective and, you know, flesh out around the edges a, a lot more than you might with just having a conversation or writing something down and placing it into a box. Um, does anyone have any more questions? I've got one. Thank you. Um, you know, in the, in this conversation, I've been thinking this is kind of comparable to, um, like the individual actions versus the bigger actions with like something like recycling. Like we all have an obligation and a responsibility to make sure that we recycle things correctly. But really, the big problem is that those things are being produced in the first place. Mm. So obviously, in in our kinds of disasters and things, we obviously have to produce those disaster plans. But what kinds of things can we do that actually have a bigger impact beyond like the individual level and I guess the individual individual level here here is like a team or an institution looking squarely at Macaulay what, what what big things can we make a little contribution to to have a bigger impact than just doing little things alone uh, while well, my Perfect. computer boots up I can unless you, you've got <laughs> <laughs> um advocating for, for um 
environmental, but for um, more climate rigorous procurement decision making um, for technological obsolescence and cloud based providers as a start. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's my. <laughs> um, does someone else want to reply while I? I even I even think having this discussion right now, like I'm just thinking about everything that everyone said. Like Lizzie, you were like, oh yeah, this even coming today was like a reminder that we need to do more training. And then I was mm. thinking, just all the discussions we're having now in this room. I'm sure your brain's all going ding 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 ding. Like when you go back to work, you might tell someone something. So I think it is like, to me, it's about conversations, like just talking about it and thinking about things that you haven't thought about in different ways. That's just, I guess, that's not a big picture, but I think it's amazing all of us have a big impact because we can go out and tell one person or two people and then that spreads. Like, it's amazing how, you know, anyway, that's what I think. I think having this discussion in the first place could save a lot of collections in the future. Can I ask what you meant? with the cloud based what was the point Sorry. um so at the moment data centers are contributing to global warming and the equivalent to that of the airline industry okay so um that's one of the things um so that i've got to the two really big things are around um reducing our reliance on um uh cloud storage and that means that the things that we can do in our space is to make sure that we're actually appraising and deleting mm -hmm. things that don't need to be kept and continuing to push back against that idea that oh we can just put everything in the cloud we can just in case yeah. oh, um because that's actually a really key risk um, it's a big cost because it's so state so, yeah. was talking about that because yeah. they've got terabytes of film and they're putting it into the cloud and it's costing them a fortune so, that's the real reason that we started deleting stuff at work because I won't say how much the bills were, but what was the yearly bill very quickly yeah. became the monthly bill within the yeah. next years, and they're like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if data centers were a country, they would be the sixth largest consumer of energy in the world. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. And what's the alternative? Um, it's a, it's a, <laughs> well, one is one is appraisal, obviously, and not keeping things. Um, uh, one is looking at um, so a lot of cloud based, but you know, the, the the thing is that cost balance, isn't it? Like at the moment, um, it's low cost, but as um, storage providers start putting more rigorous climate controls, and actually. Um, then they'll probably wanting they'll they'll look to offset that cost onto the consumer, which is us. And suddenly the monthly bill, mm -hmm. the yearly bill will be the monthly. But um, I think there's a lot of like un, un, misunderstanding around cloud too. Like I think people just think if we put in the cloud, it's you know, it's not as simple as that. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. only one type of cloud as well, because I guess there's kind of a secondary level of appraisal there too, with mm -hmm. the stuff that you don't need to keep at all versus the two categories of things of does it need to be in hot, hot storage that you can access it really quickly or can mm. it go into deep glaciers type of storage? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The longer retrieval time, but it yeah. uses yeah. less energy. Yeah. I, 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 most of you would have a lot of I would have heard of Zan Jack Zastro. Um um one of um they're an archivist for the US Senate and they one of my favorite quotes lately was that they wrote Climate change will affect libraries and archives in ways we can hardly yet fathom, and it's happening faster than any of us have imagined. So, the the last you're going to have to shut me up in a minute because, <laughs> um, but the last IPCC report said that um, the rise in weather and climate extremes has led to some irreversible impacts as natural and human systems are pushed beyond their ability to cope. So we're at that point now. Um, and it's not we can't wait for the next generation to come up and to fix it. It's our generation that has to fix it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to shut up. You guys are getting it because they had to shut down essentially our whole Italy campus because they couldn't put their aircon below, I think, 26 degrees, but the equipment couldn't actually operate at that. So they're like, we can't open the oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. So it's little things like that, I think. Yeah. I'm noticing our IT guys are paying more attention to stuff. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Can I be cheeky and ask a follow-up question to that? 
just because my current role is looking at Australia's future climate needs and what I'm finding is that everyone finds it really difficult to articulate what their needs are. Mm. Does anyone have any idea of what kind of climate information is going to be useful Ooh. to them in the future or yeah, now? Coming to the top. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's, hard, it's really hard to articulate it, and so I'm just curious yeah. if anyone can. Well, we're very aware, for example, that a lot of our power goes on to our HVAC system, mm -hmm. and traditionally the um, environmental requirements that conservation as a profession has recommended for material storage, a variety of materials, mm -hmm has required a lot from our mm -hmm. HVAC systems. And there are lots of reviews of that going on at the moment. And we have just, as in Museums Victoria, we've just put together a new preservation environments for collections strategy, which relaxes some of that in mm -hmm. response to a desire to manage the collections mm -hmm. in a responsible way that includes environmental responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and we have we have <laughs> things like, um, and again, we have an advantage of, you know, a building envelope that does buffer us against changes. And so we are turning off aircon in stores at Melbourne Museum overnight. So we're doing an overnight shutdown and it is saving us money, which is nice for the bean counters oh. and also reducing our reliance on non-renewable energy sources. I mean, obviously we would like to do more, but knowing um, we've kind of used information from it's climate Australia about where the climate is going and what mm -hmm. we're going to have to be able to deal with. So it's, you know, hotter, drier conditions, mm -hmm. yep. more frequent um, rain events, which mm -hmm. again then affects humidity in those points, plus more hot, hotter days, more mm -hmm. hotter days and longer, warmer periods. And it's just going to put a lot of stress on the HVAC system in general. So adjusting what might what we're asking the HVAC system to do mm -hmm. is one way of kind of but having that information about where the climate yeah. is going is also I think and really useful. The the bed bugs in Paris are a good yeah. example, aren't they? Yeah. About our um oh. you know, we don't yet know what sort of insects swarms we're gonna get as a result of the change in Oh totally. And insects are just I mean they yeah. be a, they're they're a collection incident that could get quite disastrous. Yeah. I mean during as we worked out in COVID, our biggest threat when we were looking at risks for the collection with us not being there was insects. Um so they yeah. can have a quite a disastrous effect yeah. on and yeah, exactly the climate is gonna change insect life quite a lot <laughs> oh, oh my god i just like i was at this public mm -hmm. online conference recently and like the head of conservation at the queensland state archives was like we can't we can't you know we used to know what periods but with climate change and everything mm -hmm. there's just there's less kind of certainty around this you know this oh, period so of the year the seasonal sort of stuff so they were like ah, like you know pretty much you know like insects it was such an interesting talk on pest management because, yeah. like, Queensland has insects. Oh, yeah. They're like, how do these geckos get in here? We don't have any, like, Amazing. they still get in. I know. I, my crazy. facilities manager keeps telling me about the mouse plays and how they're <gasps> heading down. I'm like, awesome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> times at work, I've screamed and had my legs up, and then we had three days of mouse mice running up and down. The corridor, we couldn't get it. So, yeah, like, this is going to be our <laughs> life in the future. Yes. I guess that that's a, a re bit of a recommendation then, isn't it, to think about what information is going to be needed in order to make these kinds of decisions about mm -hmm. collections and not only how the climate is going to change, but yes. the secondary effects that yeah. are going to also impact, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. insects, mm -hmm. like thinking about where like the like heat sinks are and yep. you know, yeah. all those kinds of things that when you overlay it with climate change are also going to be threats to collections. Wow, we've got like, oh my lordy, it's already 7.01. Can I put in a quick plug? You can. The International Council of Archives have just started an, a climate working group. Mm -hmm. So I'm on it. I'll report back. Please do. But, um, if anyone else wants to get involved, let me know. Yeah, I won't put my hand up because I'm very bad. And You're I'm already like, busy. Many things. <laughs> um, but no, like I really think, yeah, it would be really good to hear more from about that as well, Michaela. Mm -hmm. Um so I'm just going to stop the conversation because we I could talk to you guys all, all night. I just want to say thank you to Lizzie.
Kim, Mikhail and John um, for a really fascinating conversation. I wasn't sure where this would go and I know I probably made you all a little bit worried leading up to this, but I knew it was going to be awesome and interesting. So thank you. And also, like, I think I saw a comment in the chat. It's a valuable conversation, I think. Um, so hopefully we can continue to have this conversation. Thanks, everybody.